I really appreciate you joining us today on the Ultra AF podcast. Just can we just start with something really easy? What in the world is a picnic? Well, a picnic is my definition of it is it's a it's a it's a, it's a human powered <clears throat> multi sport adventure where at least one part of it should really scare you. That's like my own definition, right? And um, and that's kind of like how I look at it. And you coined the phrase, is, is at least as far as I'm, I'm, as far as I know, as far as I'm aware. Is that correct? Yeah, I did. I did. I um, I uh, I wrote I wrote a little <clears throat> I wrote a little thing about the picnic when it first happened. Um, and I was and I made light of it. You know, it was a sort of a joke when it started. You know, it was a little bit of a way to to comment on like how ridiculous people in Jackson are Jackson Hole are, right? It's a bunch of like competitive A type, you know, like cardi hoes, as I like to call them. And um, you know, and everybody's always upstaging each other. And it's like, how fast can you do the grand? And like, you know, it's like um when I when I first got to Jackson, like if you want to be considered a local, it's like you climb the grand in a day, right? Like that was kind of like the thing. And um and, uh, you know, and everybody's like, it's, a, and it's, a, and that's the reason I love Jackson, right? It's all these like super dynamic, hard charging people who are just like, really like going for it, you know, for like, for the thrill of it, you know, and to make a name. Yeah, for sure. But like, I, I just, I just love like how, you know, people charge here, right? Like Jacksonville has the worst nightlife in the Rockies mm. because we all get up early, you know, and, um, and the picnic was kind of a response to all of this, you know, kind of a jokey thing, you know, where it's like, cause you know, it was like uh, kind of ridiculous, right? There's no reason to like swim across Jenny Lake to go find the grand, you know? Um, but um, so, you know, and then when I, so when I first wrote about it, I, I, I made light of like all the different food I brought and like how I was really, it was like an excuse just to like stuff myself you know, all day in the course of this adventure. And then other people like Steve Casimiro of uh, uh, the Adventure Journal, he he picked up on that when he wrote about it and how it was, you know. And so and so when the um, Grand Teton National Park caught wind of the picnic and I heard through the grapevine, because I know the rangers and, and people who work there, that they thought that there was some sort of like secret race going on right an unauthorized race there had been some bikers who were like doing this like weekly ride which kind of turned into a race and they'd go through grand teton national park and they got upset about that so now they're hearing about this like grand teton triathlon which was its first name you know and and uh, and they were convinced that like people were you know there was prize money or whatever and so i just heard about this and i'm like no 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 no, no. you know like it needs a new name. And I thought, well, it should just be like the picnic because that's kind of what it is, you know? Like, it's, so. it's a picnic. Sounds like it's no picnic. <laughs> well, you know, it's funny. I mean, my philosophy is like when I do a picnic personally, like there's a lot of people that like go and they want to go do it really fast and they go out super hard. And my personal philosophy is I want to enjoy it. You know, I want to enjoy every part of it. And I don't want it to be like a suffer fest, right? Like I hate the word suffering in context of like exercise and, um, and, and I want to enjoy it, you know? And yeah, obviously there's like some super brutal times sometimes where you have to like really dig deep, but that's what you're also there to do. So you should be enjoying that as well. Right. And like, really it's like, that's when I consider a picnic successful, you know, yeah. like when I had a, like an amazing time from beginning to end. Yeah. Right. Well, I want to read this. I, I, I believe this came from your blog or from your website. I just want to read this so, so people have a little bit of context. Um, after considering the possibilities while celebrating a birthday on the Grand and then making a few thwart, thwarted attempts, I completed the first Grand Teton picnic in 2012, biking 23 miles from Jackson's Town Square to Jenny Lake, swimming 1.3 miles across Jenny, and hiking and climbing 10 miles to the top of the 13,775 foot Grand Teton. I returned the same way, including swimming back across the lake. And by the time I biked into the square after midnight, that's, that's a full day. I've been moving for almost 24 hours. What a picnic. Well, I'll tell you that was in 2012, right? This year, uh, <clears throat> um, what is it, 11 or 12 years later, 
um, Jan Dayton of Salt Lake City did the picnic in less than 11 hours. So like, I mean, the, the level of like what people are doing now, um, and Jen Dayton is a mom of five in Salt Lake. She is a monster in the mountains. And she just like came up this summer and just like put every, every picnicker to shame. It was absolutely amazing. Um, but yeah. And so when I did it, it's like, I hear like, when I like, you hear like, like under 24 hours, I'm like, I cringe a little bit. Right. Cause everybody's doing it so much faster than I am now. <laughs> but yeah. But David, what does it kind of mean to you? I mean, after all these years, you're sitting there talking about 12 years later. What does this yeah. mean to you that it's caught on like it has? I mean, I love that it's caught on, right? It's like, it's, it, it, it's, I love, you know, it's, it's, it tickles me to no end, right? It tickles me to oh, no end. That like, I mean, I'm not like, I don't really consider myself an athlete. I'm more of a creative exerciser. And so like that my legacy might be athletic in my life is actually like, incredibly amusing to me and a lot of my friends, especially the ones I grew up with, you know, like my, the actual extent of my athletic abilities and, you know, and that's the thing, right? Like, like a picnic is like a full on adventure that like a lot of, a lot more people can have than they think. I think the reason that the picnic is like caught on really is that it sounds like, you know, you, you read that thing. It sounds ridiculous. It sounds incredible, right? You're going to like bike all these miles. You're going to swim in the lake. You're going to climb the grand. And it just sounds like it's ridiculous, outlandish, you know, but as it turns out, like way more people can do this than, than think they can, you know? And that's like the amazing thing of like the human, of the human body, right? And the human mind is like, we have so much more, you know, potential than we realize, you know, all of us. I mean, I believe all of us, like really, like we are an athletic species, an incredibly athletic species actually, and an incredibly powerful species. When you consider I love this sort of analogy, you know, like, like, um, in the army, you can only like pack a mule with 20% of its weight, right? If you're going to like take a mule train into the mountains, 20% of its weight is nothing for some of the female, like athletes I know that will carry like 80 pounds into the mountains, right? Like 70% of their weight, you know, not like 20, like humans are actually like, because we're primates are very strong and we have more temperature uh, um, toleration than any other species on earth, basically, right? We're the only species that can actually swim, you know, five miles across a lake and then climb to the top of a mountain and come back down, you know? I mean, there, name another species that can do that, right? So, I mean, I think that like, we have these like capabilities and and what's cool is that the picnic has shown me and a few other people, a lot of other people who have done it, that we're so much more um, powerful and have so much more athletic potential than we think, you know? Yeah. It, it's really, <clears throat> the whole thing is pretty interesting. Um, when I first heard about it, um, just was interested right off the bat, but I was, I was wondering, I was curious if, I mean, did you have a triathlon background mm -hmm. before you did this? Mm -hmm. So, so, and you alluded to it earlier, swimming across the lake, biking from jackson square that has nothing to do with anything you can climb the tetons without doing either of those things right yeah yeah so what well, it's just i mean it was um i grew up in texas and so i grew up in swimming pools right so i have a lot more swimming back i was i, I didn't swim like i didn't race in school um i started like swimming laps in college just for exercise and then I started swimming in lakes in Texas because I was a counselor at a camp in Texas that um, was located right on a lake. And then uh, in my early 20s, I was a travel writer and, and a photographer. And um, wherever I, I brought goggles because I was like the smallest piece of sports gear you can bring, basically. And so then I would just like swim wherever I was. And I swam in some amazing places around the Greek Isles and in uh, Lake Atitlan and Guatemala and along all sorts of coastlines. And so I got, I was fairly used to like open water swimming, you know, when I, when I first did it, but still, you know, swimming across Jenny Lake, especially when you're by yourself in the middle of the night, which you often do when you're starting a picnic is definitely like a mental leap. Right. And that's like why, like, you know, like why it's caught on is right. Like people are goaded and they feel like pressure to do this because they want to be, think of themselves as a local. Right. Or like, cause this is kind of now like the new thing to like to prove yourself as a local is the picnic, you know? 
instead of just the grand in the day. And so people have to like sum it up, you know, like summon the, the will to do this. And then they do this thing and they've never before swam across like a big cold lake in the middle of the night. And they get to the other side and they're like, holy shit, I did that, you know? And then they go climb the grant and then they have to get in the lake and swim back, right? The second swim is really the crux of the whole thing because you don't want to get in this. Lake. And often you're getting, as I am, because it takes me a long time to do a picnic, like 20 plus hours, I'm getting back to the lake, like right at sunset. And you're just like, fuck, I'm going to swim across this lake in the dark. And I'm like, and you're wasted, you know, you're already wasted. And you just, but you come this far, right? It's right there. Like you can't not do it. And, you know, and then swimming across that lake and realizing while you're swimming it that you actually feel okay and you're doing this and then getting to that other side of the lake and like your feet touching those rocks on the other side. It's like, there's really nothing like it, you know? And then the bike ride home is like perfect, like barely declined. And it's like such a hero ride back, you know, on this beautiful pathway, like the pathways are just so amazing from the Tetons back to Jackson. And, and you just have this like hero ride looking up at the grand as like, you're like riding home. And so I think, you know, a large part of it is just, it's such a perfect, the way it's all set up, the way it like, it's just, you know, it makes for just such an amazing experience. So take us through the bike first. Um, you just mentioned it was kind of on the way back. It's, it's mostly a little bit of a down. So, so what's the bike look like? How, logistically? I mean, the, bike is chill. the bike is really chill, right? You start in the town square right at the antler arches. Um, and uh, that's like the traditional t um, beginning, you know, beginning and, and ending spot. Um, and, uh, you know, and it's like 23 miles and it's on like, you know, like there's a mile of town and then it's like 22 miles of like perfect pathway. Right. And so you can go as fast as you want. Right. You're often starting in the dark. Um, I've had just some amazing bike rides. Uh, I remember like the first time that I went and finished the picnic, this like shooting star just like fell straight down in front of me. And then I got into the park and I'm like riding along and it's like just getting light. I barely, I can barely see. And I can hear this weird sound. And I don't know what it is. And I look over and there's like a whole herd of elk running alongside me that I hadn't even been aware of, right? I mean, this park is like full of elk. It's full of wildlife, right? Like not many triathlons have that um, aspect to them. And um, so, you know, like the bike ride is actually like, it's it's magical. It's idyllic, you know? And, um, and some people just like blast it in like less than an hour, but it takes me longer than that. Yeah. Well, I've got a triathlon background. That's why I was I was curious. Yeah. Surely, for someone to create this mountain triathlon, which I guess some people call it, yeah, surely you had that background, but you didn't. No, the, no, and I didn't have, really have a biking background except mount, being a mountain biker and yeah, you know, like in the mountains. But um, yeah, I mean the bike. There's one. There's like a couple little hills. It's mostly flat though. You know, it's actually like very. It's it's a great warm up, really. Mm -hmm. You know, for the rest of it. And then the swim, 1.3 miles. So that's going to be what about, it's going to be about 2000 meters, roughly. Mm -hmm. um, what's that? The, what's the it's, lake it's, like? It's got to be freezing cold. Well, it, it actually is what, what's interesting. And one of the cool things that I've learned is like how much these, the temperatures of these lakes and all bodies of water like vary over the course of a summer, right? You know, and, and, um, and if you do a picnic early, which I don't really recommend because there's often a lot of snow on the ground. Um, you know, the lake would be, you know, sub, sub 55, right? But later in August, it'll be above 60 degrees, which, you know, it's not that bad. No, it's right? not bad. Yeah. And, you know, and everybody's wearing wetsuits and, um, you know, I have a, I have like a, you know, like a cold water swimming wetsuit. And so it's, it's pretty comfy. I mean, you definitely, you know, it's, it's cold enough that you want that. Right. What time of year do you recommend doing it? You recommend mm. August later in the summer? No, I tell you what, like, I mean, I mean, really, it's like, it's sort of horrible because it is like the most crowded part of the entire year. But the very best stretch to do a picnic in, in my opinion, is like July 15th to the very end of July. We, it's this weird thing in Jackson Hole, like I've noticed over 25 years of living here that like winter to me, like starts August 1st. Cause that August 1st is when I always feel like, the temperature dips and things change a little bit. We always, we very traditionally get this like incredible um, 
high pressure that like sits over the Tetons in July, particularly late July. The warmest uh, day statistically in the Tetons is July 22nd. And I often find like my two favorite dates are July 22nd and July 29th. I like for whatever reason, those are like my favorite, you know, like um, numerological dates to start picnics on. But like once you move into August, you're often like dealing with like a monsoonal flow. And then you have, you know, and then there's like storms coming in in the afternoon for a picnic, like really like because you have so many other factors to think about. I want to do it when I know like the forecast says 100 percent bomber, bluebird, blue sky. Right. No chance of precip. Right. Um, and once you get into August, it's it's um, those days are are less frequent. So, yeah, July is kind of the month. And you're talking to someone who's never been there. I've never been to Jackson. I've never really? been. I've never been to the Tetons. I want to go. It's it's way up there on my list of things to do for sure. Picnic. No doubt about it. Definitely do right. it. First first thing I do when I get there. Sweet. Um, take me through the climb up. Uh, what's what's the climb up the Tetons look like? Well, the climb, um, the climb is, uh, is it's normally seven miles when you swim the lake and you know, like the way that the route goes, it's funny how people do this. Like you're supposed to swim straight across the lake, right? Cause that's the most engaging, right? That's the most committing, you know? And then people have like figured out well, if they swim kind of alongside the shore, they can actually swim almost like the same distance, but with a lot less like commitment. And then they also end up closer to the trailhead, right? But if you swim straight across from the overlook to the boat dock, which takes you straight across the middle of Jenny Lake, then the, you have to you have to walk three miles to get to the Lupin Meadows Trailhead, right? And that is kind of like that. It might be like the crux of the of the picnic. Those three miles, especially when you're coming back down, you know, you get to the trailhead and you have to walk another three miles to get back to the lake. But I don't know, you know, it's not the same. Swimming like alongside the edge of a lake is not the same thing as swimming across it, right? Well, especially if you're cutting three miles off of a off of a yeah, little well, you're cutting like hike. probably like a couple miles. Yeah, you're cut you're cutting a couple miles for sure. Um but uh but yeah, so then you see so you 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 walk out three miles and you get to the Lupin Meadows trailhead, and um and then you've got like yeah, it's funny. I've done that climb and that like hike. Like I have no, you know, a hundred times more than that. And so I have every switchback memorized. And it's funny because I know all like the hardest, like most strenuous parts, you know. And so you basically it's like you you switch back up into the Tetons and then the trail takes you into Garnet Canyon. Um, and then you like start climb up into this beautiful, like it's the throne room of the mountain gods, basically, when you get there. It's just incredible. Um, and you walk up this like gorgeous Canyon, Garnet Canyon, so named because there used to be like garnets stuck in the rocks that a lot of people have pried out, unfortunately by now, but, um, but you follow kind of like a, kind of a, a shitty trail, pretty rough trail. And it takes you all the way up to the lower saddle between the Grand Teton and the Middle Teton. Um, and that's where like the climb, you know, kind of starts. And then you walk up a worsening trail up towards the Grand Teton and you have to do at least like one fifth class move before you get to the upper saddle. Now, um, David, real quick, fifth class yeah. move, take us through that. What, what do you mean by that? Fifth class moves basically means like a move that is, you know, fairly small holds with exposure that you do not want to fall off. You'll get like seriously hurt or killed. Right. Like that's what like fifth class is. It's normally something that you rope up for where the guides, when they take people up the grand, they rope them through this one section in the gully that takes you up to the upper saddle. The upper saddle is the little saddle between the, there's a little West hump called the enclosure and the main grand. Right. And then once you get to the upper saddle, it's technical climbing, really. And that means like it's easy fifth climbing. So it's not like Alex Honnold style free soloing. Right. It's like the holds are bigger. It's not as steep, you know, or as um, consistent. Right. But it's very it's blocky climbing. But there are a few places where your ass is literally hanging out over thousands of feet of exposure. Right. In order to get from the upper saddle up into like the upper mountain, you, you have to do this like hand traverse, which is like as spicy as you, you know, like big holds, great big holds, but definitely like 
where most people will want to um, rope up. When I first like was talking about the picnic, I said like the way to do the picnic is that you have to like solo it. Cause that's like, like really like how it's done and sort of everybody like, you know, and I've changed my own mind and now I've done numerous picnics with a rope, you know, it's not, you can, these days, like the gear is so light, right. You can, you can bring, you know, like two 30 meter pieces of rope, a fairly like a like a skinny like a skinny single as they're called and just a couple of pieces of protection and then you are protected for the grand teton you know unless you're a really good climber unless you already have done the grand solo the grand teton i do not uh i do not um recommend uh soloing the grand the first time on a picnic mm. right because it is it is real and people unfortunately tragically perish up there every mm. year so it is, it is. And that's why like the picnic is like a thing, right? That's the part that scares you. Like in the picnic, there's a couple of parts, right? There's swimming across the lake and there's a few of these moves on the ground that are like d legitimately scary, you know? And so you got to be prepared for that, but that's like part of the deal. Like you learn how to do that. Like you get, you gain those skills, you go with somebody who, you know, knows what they're doing. Um, you you hire a guide right and you can do that people are hiring exum guides and jackson mountain guides you know to help them with the climbing part of the picnic you know they can't guide you across the lake but they can guide you from the trailhead to the summit and back right yeah. um so yeah and it's but it's also like really really fun climbing and i've done picnics also where i've gone up you know not the easiest way but like the the uh, uh which is the owen spalding route but I've also done a picnic involving the Exum Ridge, which I call like the most the most beautiful uh, jungle gym in the sky. It's just amazing. Mm. It's just, like golden knobs with like the world like on either side of you. It's just incredible. Um, and people are starting to do other routes on the uh, on, you know, on the ground as part of picnics, which is pretty sweet. What's the main route up? What is there? Is there a main it's, route that it's most people Spalding. The, the 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 path of least resistance is the Owen Spalding route named for Billy Owen and Reverend Spalding. They're guys who did it, climbed it in 1898, credited with the first um, ascent, at least by whiteies, right? And um, uh, and uh, I actually believe I'm almost certain that like, somebody climbed it before them, like who knows how many, you know, hundreds of years ago. Um, but um they yeah it's and it goes up the it goes to the upper saddle and then it goes up kind of like the west face of the grand and um and it's ledgy and it's super fun right it's on the shadowy side of the mountain so unlike the Exum ridge which is on the sunny side of the mountain that's like really that's why that's like really nice to climb um but um yeah you know it's when you, there's a lot of people that like their picnics come to a halt at the upper saddle cuz they get up there and they're already like pretty whacked by everything they've already done. And now they have to like deal with like real climbing and it's a very intimidating spot, you know? So, um, and a lot of times like I feel like dizzy and I kind of like sick when I get there and I don't really want to do it. But as soon as I start climbing, it's funny how my body kind of relaxes into it and I, I lose my like div dizziness or whatever. And then it's just like fun, you know? But, but you, you know, when you get really tired, it's like you get, you can lose your footing more easily. It's, it's, I mean, yeah, it's, it's, it's legit. Well, I mean, you're, you're almost at 14,000 feet. I mean, if you're somebody like me, I'm coming from basically sea level. Right. So, I mean, their altitude sickness is a very, very real thing. Oh yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. You know, and the most important thing, you know, one of the most important things I've learned from picnicking, yeah, it's like, I mean, this is like kind of like, it's turned me into an athlete because I did the first one and then I did, uh, you know, another one on Mount Moran and people started doing that one too, you know, and then I've done all these other ones and what started, it's kind of a joke. Now I'm like completely obsessed with myself. Right. And in the course of like becoming obsessed and as I'm like getting older, you know, and like trying to figure out how to still do them at a fairly, you know, high level, I've had to like learn a lot about, you know, myself and physiology and training and nutrition and hydration, right? And like that, and hydration is the number one factor in determining your success on any of these like missions, right? Like that is, you know, and I've learned like, I have to like start hydrating before I do a picnic. Like I start like three days ahead mm. and, and, um, and, uh, I, um, and then you have to like stay hydrated, but you also have to keep your electrolytes electrolytes up, and you know how it goes. I'm sure you have that um, no. a lot of that knowledge yourself. 
but you know, I sort of had all had to learn this and like, yeah, it's like, as far as altitude, like hydration is also the determining factor mm -hmm. for sure. Yeah. Well, and I want to get to more of those, um, more of those types of things here in a second, but take me, take me the, the back down. What's right, it? So I mean, it's got to be, it seems like yeah. it's going to be pretty treacherous coming down then. Well, it is, it is, but, but, you know, like, it, you know, once it's all downhill, you know, then it is, you, you've, you know, that like when you're, you, when you get to the top of the grand and you're like, holy shit, I'm only halfway there. But then you're also like, thank God, like I'm here right now. It's just downhill and you, you know, and you have to pick your way down. And if you've brought ropes, you know, you're going to do a, a pretty exciting repel. That's an overhanging repel. Um, that you uh, need at least a 60 mountain rope for, and you need to know like how to like hang the rope in the right way. So you can reach like the bottom with a 60 meter rope. Um, if you're down soloing, you know, you need to make sure that you're like totally dialed on where you do the down solo. Um, it's not difficult, but you it, it definitely recommend like going up there and doing it at least once before you do it as a picnic. Right. Okay. Um, and you have to, you know, and it's steep and it's tricky. And I like, you know, it's sort of like awful, right? Like that whole descent from the upper saddle all the way down to the lower saddle. By the time you get to the lower saddle, you're feeling a lot better. And then a lot of people will just like, they'll go down. There's this big fixed rope over one cliff between the, 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 the canyon, the moraine of the canyon and that lower saddle. You get past, you, you let yourself down that fixed rope and then you can almost like run, which like the fastest people do, they'll, they'll run seven miles all the way back down to the trailhead and run three miles back to the lake. I can't do that. My legs will not. I mean, it's really like steep and it's super hard and it's like all rubble, you know? Mm -hmm. So it's um that, I mean, that's like the crux really, you know, it's like walking down all that crap. I mean, obviously like trekking poles make a big difference, especially ones that you can like uh, shorten, um, all the guides have figured out that like actually using trekking poles at like a short length, right? So you're not using the folding ones. You're actually using the extendable ones. And then you use them as like almost like two extra spider feelers on your hands instead mm -hmm. of, you know, because it is steep and weird and like, it'll definitely save your knees. Um, if that's a concern of yours. Yeah. But um, yeah, I mean, and then, you know, it's like, it's, it's a lot of, uh, switchbacks, you know, it's 7,000 feet of elevation. So it's a good long ways up and a good long ways down. I recommend like shoes. Like if you, if you are a pretty decent climber, a shoe like the Hoka speed goat, you know, will save your legs on the way down too. I mean, the shoes they're making these days are just fucking incredible, you know, and you can climb like technical shit in a running shoe. If you're, if you get used to that, you know, if you can do it, you know, it's possible for sure. Take me through the logistics of this, because this is probably a, a big question. A lot of folks are going to yeah. have. So you're sitting here right. talking about, I got to, first of all, I have a bicycle. I'm not right. carrying a bicycle up to the top of the Teton. So no, 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 you leave the bicycle at the lake, right? You leave the bicycle, you ride your bike to the lake and, and then you lock up. There's a bike rack, rack right oh, there okay. at, the, at the overlook. Um, or you can like lock it to, there's lots of trees to lock your tr bike to, Right. You leave your bike there in your in your shoes and your bike helmet and your bike bike and clothes. Right. You change into your, you know, and you have to like carry either on your back or on a um a rack, right? Or in a in a frame bag, right? You gotta have your wetsuit, right, and your hiking clothes and your food, right? You don't have to bring very much water because there's water along the whole way. Is there? Yeah, there is actually. Um yeah, you can actually like you know, you bring enough water to get you to the lake and like, um, uh, basically like, uh, I usually bring enough water, um, to get me to the lake, right. So I can bike, but I've also like hydrated my ass off. So I'm obviously uh, often not drinking very much on the way, you know, and I'm actually peeing a lot in my wetsuit on the lake. Right. And then you're like getting out of the lake and, um, and, and, and you can actually like there are springs along the way, the whole way that like all the locals will just drink from and they don't treat. Um, I've never treated. I've never gotten sick from it. It's the best water in the world, in my opinion, because it's coming out from underneath the Grand Teton. And I don't actually like carry water 
as I'm going up the Grand because there's this there's what's called Horse Piss Springs at the very at like one of the switchbacks. It's literally the best water tasting water you can imagine. It's so funny that it has that name. Um, and then you get it all the way up to um, Spalding Falls, and that's actually like a, a a spring that's coming straight out of the rocks. And so you fill your water bottle there. It's about like you know like two hours up. And then there's another spring on the lower saddle where you can fill up there. And then there's actually a couple more springs on the way up the Grand there, if you know where they are, right? So you can actually like get away without carrying water, which saves a lot of a lot of weight. Sure. Right? Um, and um, uh, you know, and, and the way that you okay, so so you have like your stuff on your on a you know, I don't like to carry anything on a on my back when I'm riding a bike, so I just put everything on my rack. You know, and you put it and what I do is I stuff like a small dry bag, right? And the dry bag is what you're going to tow across the lake. Um, you know, so you get to the lake, you put on your wetsuit and then I have like a dry bag and I put my shoes and my hiking clothes and my food, right? And maybe a little bit of water that I can drink on the other side of the lake. Um, and I put it, I, I roll it, you know, roll it up into a dry bag and then I have a belt in my wet on my wetsuit and about 10 feet of line, right? And I just clip the dry bag. And a dry bag, just if it's if it's not full of water, a dry bag will float and you won't even notice it. You know, I like I carry, you know, on on the winds picnic, I carried, you know, I towed four days of climbing gear and food and water and camping gear, you know, in a 60 liter dry bag, right? Which I also can use as a backpack. Wow. And that's I put it on, you know, and I and I and I put it on my bike. Um, you know, distributed between the rack and a frame bag. Um, so yeah, you just load everything on your bike and then you put it in a dry bag, you tow the dry bag across the lake. You, when you get to the other side of the lake, you pull your stuff out, you know, it's like you find a place to stash your wet, hang, you, like pull your wet side, wetsuit inside out, um, hang it in a tree. And there's plenty of that, those around. Um, and, um, and then you go climb the grand, you come back. So that's how kind of the, the logistics work out. Yeah, that's really interesting and a great tip for just the water. That's really convenient, <laughs> like oh, yeah. overly convenient. Yeah. Oh, yeah, totally. I mean, it's actually kind of a cool, I mean, you know, it's like I've done the uh, the the, Moran, the Moronic, which is another picnic in the Tetons that crosses uh, Jackson Lake, right? So that's a longer bike ride. It's about 35 miles and it's a five mile swim across and then you're climbing the Northeast wow. Ridge and around and I break it into a few days. Right. So I'm bringing all sorts of stuff and, mm -hmm. you know, and I've learned how to like pack my, my road bike, um, you, you know, to do this. Um, and, uh, it works great. Yeah. Yeah. So you met in the very beginning, um, uh, of this interview, you mentioned the Rangers <laughs> and I wanted to ask you specifically about the park Rangers, once they kind of realize it's not a race, so there's yeah. no actual no laws are being broken. It doesn't no. seem no, but <laughs> surely they're still they know about this. I would assume by now. Oh yeah. And and what's their general the sense that you get their general feelings about just folks doing this kind of challenge? Well, I'm sure that they are probably concerned. I'm sure they're concerned with people getting in over their heads, like I am. Like I've heard a few horror stories about um people somebody told me that they ran into a group uh up high on the ground and they were all doing the picnic together and they were repelling the um sergeant's chimney and there one of them was like falling asleep at the rappel station and i was like oh god you know i mean that's like my big, biggest fear is that somebody in the course of doing a picnic is going to get hurt or killed you know and 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 I think that like and of course like that's the Rangers' concern too that like somebody is going to be too exhausted when they go to climb the Grand, and they're going to like make a mistake. But it hasn't happened yet, you know. And 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 I hope it never does, you know. I don't know. I mean, um, but I'm sure you know. It's like there's a lot of people doing like unbelievable stuff in the Tetons these days. You know, it's like picnic is probably like the least of their concerns to be honest. <laughs> Well, given the scheme that's going on in the Tetons, like that's way more concerning, I'm sure, to them. Really? Yeah. So it sounds like you still, you live in the area? You've lived yeah. in the area for a while? 
Mm-hmm. What's it like up there? Just kind of describe what that whole entire area is like. What's it like from just a weather standpoint, a tourism standpoint, and just obviously a beautiful, a beauty standpoint. Well, I mean, the thing about Jackson Hole is that it is like a very unique place in the world because Jackson sits in the middle of the greater Yellowstone ecosystem, right? And the greater Yellowstone ecosystem is 20 million acres of, of wilderness basically. Right. And, and, um, and there's not very many uh, towns in it. And Jackson's hole is like kind of right in the middle. And this is like some of the wildest uh, uh, um, country, certainly in the lower 48 States. And like these days, almost like in the world, because so many ecosystems around the world have, been degraded you know and and uh, and the greater yellowstone ecosystem i think one of the most amazing my favorite uh facts about it is that lewis and clark came through here in like 1805 1806 all the same animals that existed then exist now in this area mm. except for like maybe like one little shrew I, as i understand so that's incredible, right? Like we we have wolves and mountain lions and grizzly bears and black bears and like elk and sheep and wolverines and bald eagles and golden eagles and like it's just incredible, right? And so I mean that is like really the defining the defining thing about this whole this whole landscape is that it really is an in one of the last intact temperate ecosystems on earth. And um and so, you know, it's like, while, you know, while like the picnic is like, and all these other, like these like athletic feats are cool, you know, it's like, I always try and keep in perspective that like, you know, I'm a visitor and these are like, this is like the home of a incredible like system inter, you know, an intertwined interlock system of all these different animals and creatures and, and, and plants. And, um, and this is like, and really the point of this whole place is to ensure that that continues to exist. Right. And that's like, and that, and that's why Jackson coming to Jackson hole is amazing because, you know, you can, you, you can be a visitor here and you can see a grizzly bear from the road. Right. You can see like wolves through a spotting spoke, you know, a scope, you know, and, and there's moose next to the road and there's like herds of thousands of elk on the elk refuge when you drive North out of town and um and that's like really the special thing about it you know and then there are like these incredible mountains you know and the tetons are this oddity little oddity of a range you know they're very very young they're only like 10 to 14 or 15 million years old they've only uplifted you know like in a very short when you consider that the rocks that are up high when you're climbing the grand teton and there's all this like crazy striped and like squiggly lined rock with all these like, and it's nice, you know, it's spelled G-N-E-I-S-S. It's like a very, very ancient rock that has been like pressured and melted and it's finally exposed. And it's two to 3 billion years old, you know, in this like 14 million year old range, right? So the Tetons have this incredible feeling of like rawness and youthfulness as far as mountains go, but also like incredible age. And, and, and the other interesting thing about the Tetons is that they are at the very end of this vast funnel of the Snake River Plain, which is the entire western, northwestern part of the country, basically. And it funnels storms all the way into the Tetons. And there's this little like 30 mile range, which stands right at like the neck of the funnel. And so that's why the Tetons get just incredible amounts of snow and um, precipitation all year. So that's, and that's another reason that like, this this ecosystem is so healthy, right? Because of the, the the geographic location of the range, and then you have this like little town that's just gotten a lot weirder um, uh, in the last few years because you know it was sort of a secret and it was inconvenient to get to, and it's had a reputation for being really really cold for a long time, and that's all sort of changed, right? And this airport can bring in the biggest planes there are, right? And and um, and now, like somebody, I recently called it. I recently heard it uh, called uh, Jaspin Hole um, because of. Uh, and somebody was saying this to me, like, "Oh yeah, now we're Jaspin Hole as we're watching this like woman walk across the town square with like a snakeskin jacket on, <laughs> like a cowboy hat, like an Instagram cowboy hat." And you're just like, oh. you know, because Jackson used to be like pretty low key, right? And there were 
wealthy people here, but there is sort of like, that was like the vibe. It wasn't like a showy mountain town like Aspen or Vail or even Sun Valley, right? It was like the low key place, but that has, that has changed. And so like the, the flavor and a lot of people here that who live here are really embittered by how it's changed. And of course, like the housing prices are insane. And a lot of people have been pushed out. So there's a lot of turmoil in Jackson now, which is a really unfortunate, um, but if you can get past that turmoil of this like rapidly changing town, there is still this incredible ecosystem. 22 mountain ranges, right? Some of the most amazing forests on earth, some of the most amazing fishing on earth, you know, and um, and just wild, as wild as you can get. Like you step off the trail in Yellowstone National Park, you are back right in the middle of the food chain. You know what I mean? And you feel it, right? And that's really like, that's way cooler and more exciting, even like climbing the Grand Teton, if you ask me. Yeah, it's a lot scarier. <laughs> I think for someone like <laughs> me. Who... Yeah. I mean, the northern part of the Teton, you know, it's, you know, Grizzlies have been, do they have done well. They have done a really good job of prioritizing their um, survival in these uh, different agencies. So grizzlies have done well and they're spreading, you know, like, and they're, and they're for a long time, they had been, you know, they had been all like the grizzlies had been kind of done away with, except in Yellowstone, you know, and now they're moving back into the Tetons, they're moving back into the Grove, they're moving back into the winds all the way South, you know, to the Southern end of the winds. And so, yeah, it's only getting wilder actually. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it sounds, David, it sounds like you have like a lot of a healthy respect for everything that's you know going on around um, that area where did that come from i mean living here you know it's like i mean that's why i mean living here and just like falling in love with these mountains and i before here i lived in colorado and i loved those mountains too i lived in breckenridge and and um you know and i think that like you know you just realize that the that there's so much more to the world than what we humans are always perceiving there you know <clears throat> i mean people in, who who unfortunately like live in cities and don't get to see like these places it's you know you don't realize like that's like the world like the natural systems that exist on this earth are so incredible you know it's like so intricate you know and so mind-blowing once you start getting into them i got into you know i started backcountry skiing and then i learned about you know, some of the forests here and like the white bark pine, which is it's like particular species of tree that's up high, like they're the highest species of plant in the in these in this ecosystem. And these are trees that basically live to be 2000 years old and they live up where the soil is super thin and it's really cold and it's really windy and they produce pine nuts, just like the pine nuts we eat. And it's like the best source of protein in this entire ecosystem best source of plant source of plant protein in this whole ecosystem and it's and these trees are providing this protein source to all these other like animals and um and they're the keystone species and 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 the way that other plants and i mean the way that other animals like depend on these seeds and like, i just got way into it and then these trees started getting massacred by beetles by mountain pine beetle and then i started actually like a a a, a group called tree fight to um, actually put uh, these um, pouches, these chemical pouches on trees to um, dissuade beetles from landing on them, which actually does kind of work. And they do in Grand Teton National Park to this day. But like, I, you know, I, I fell in love with this place so much from just being here and, and playing in the mountains that like, you know, I spent a solid four years of my life trying to like protect these like ancient, beautiful trees. Wow. Oh. And in the end, I gained a different like philosophy about like what, you know, humans can do for climate change and what we can do about like these environmental problems. And it was an education, but it's all about like, that's why, you know, like a lot of people, locals and like places like this, they, they like get upset about like the numbers of people who are here hiking or climbing or backcountry skiing. And I'm like, bring it on. We need more people in the mountains. We need more people to fall in love with the mountains because the more you fall in love with the mountains, the more you really realize like how incredible these natural systems are and it makes you want to protect them, you know? So bring it on more backcountry skiers, you know, more hikers, more cl climbers, please come to the Tetons. <laughs> yeah. I mean, well, it's definitely, it's way, like I said, it's way up there on the list. It's definitely yeah. something I want to do soon. Um, what's it like in July there from a tourism standpoint, from a, from a, you know, people visiting 
um, it's Grand hard. Teton. It's, you know, it's it's hard to find a place to stay. It's like it's hard to find a place. You know, it's expensive. Um, camping is is difficult. You know, like a lot of people are trying to live in the forest these days. You know, just as housing, right? While they have their like service jobs, so like all the agencies have like clamped down harder on um, you know just random camping. So it's tricky, you know, if you have a van, it's definitely like helpful. That makes it a little bit easier. Um, and um, there you can, you know, you can, I mean, really like the thing to do is like, just get here and like, go, go backpacking somewhere, you know, and, and that's really like how this place is best enjoyed. And it's like the cheapest way to go. And it's, it's, um, and it's how you can like, find a place to stay most easily <laughs> mm -hmm. is it is it busier in the summer than it i know skiing is a big oh, thing yeah. but it's way yeah, yeah, busier yeah. in the summer way busier in the summer yeah. yeah yeah and the traffic is getting out of control like they this town is not really built to handle any traffic right with all these two-lane roads that they still don't want to change though we're gonna have to you know and, and um so this town is really very poorly equipped to deal with with that kind of traffic so yeah, yeah it's tricky What's the, what's the national park like compared to just everything that's around it? Not just the town, but just all the other wilderness that's around it, all the other hiking and maybe other activities. What's the actual national park like compared to everything else? Well, Grand Teton National Park is, you know, what's interesting is that like, you realize like a lot of other parks are always like trying to, I don't know, I don't, maybe even like dissuade people like Yellowstone is almost really doesn't like to be people out like backpacking uh, very much it feels like because they don't have as much of as as good of a rescue team and um and it's a lot vaster and 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 i think but grand teton national park is unique among parks in that they really like the the administration knows that it's a park where people are getting after it and like going to all the nooks and crannies of the park to do dangerous things you know and that's just part of it so they have like the best ranger rescue outfit, you know, in this country besides, you know, like Yosemite rescue. And these guys are like the ones who are like really like developing the rescue techniques that like a lot of other places are using. And, um, and so it's cool because this is like a range, like a national park, which really like welcomes and understands that like people want to um, really like get after it in the mountains, you know, and you can also like, you know, uh, Grand Teton is also, I mean, you can also, it's, it's, it's crowded, like the really popular trails. If you're like not much of a mountaineer and you just want to do like the most popular trails, it's going to feel crowded. Right. But if you do have the capability mm -hmm. to go to the more obscure trailheads and to go to the more obscure trails, you can still, even in the dead of summer, find as much solitude as you want. Right. You could, get take a canoe across the northern part of Jackson Lake and be in the northern Tetons and then you're right there in grizzly bear country with nobody else around so thank you yeah and any any trails you recommend like you're talking about some of the ones that aren't quite as uh, popular i mean you know like the the trails that go from the west side of the Tetons actually from the Idaho side are are really cool and a little bit less popular um like the one, like I was saying, like the, the ones in the northern part of the park, if you if you can canoe across Jackson Lake, which at the northern end is it's only a mile or even a half mile across. It's not very wide. Um, but you do have to understand like the dangers of canoeing on a big wild alpine lake, right? Um there's uh there's like uh you know, paintbrush um canyon is really beautiful. Um, and a little bit less known if you are willing to do a little bushwhacking going up avalanche Canyon, there's nobody up there. Mm -hmm. Um, there is a, uh, there's a Canyon just South of, of Jacksonville mountain resort, um, Grok Springs Canyon, which has a really nice trail that goes up it. Um, basically it's a climber's trail, uh, and very, it's not, not even marked on maps actually, but it's, it's, um, it's gorgeous. And, um, you know, and then if you really want, you can go off trail and, uh, and and thrash around and do some bushwhacking and hope you don't run into a bear. And you can like, um, you know, the, the moronic is another, it's the other picnic that I was mentioning uh, that you um, swim across Jackson Lake and you can, you actually swim island to island. And I did it uh, last 
uh, last summer with my friend Vienna, who was the first woman to pull off the moronic. Um, and um, she also did a couple of other uh, picnics involving free soloing that were like quite impressive, actually. And um, and so we swam across the lake, and and then you like, and then you have this bushwhack to get up to the northeast ridge of Mount Moran, that is the most savage bushwhack in the Tetons. And once you get above that, you get up high on Mount Moran. It's like the the just around the corner uh, on the south side of Mount Moran, there's the CMC route, and there's people going up down up and down that like all day long. You're saying hi to people, you know, rap passing people on the climb. You go around the corner to this northeast ridge, and you're by yourself, mm. and it feels like you just got transported back like decades, if not centuries. Because there is like nobody else, and you are completely on your own. And if you like, if your phone ran out of juice and like somebody got hurt, like how are you gonna? You don't you don't have like a boat at all. You don't have like how are you going to like get a, you know like arrange a rescue for something that happens up on this really sketchy, sketchy, and much looser mountain. So by you know that's like just right in the tetons like right around the corner from like all these people who are like in this one place and we're over here and it like feels like a completely different situation much much wilder wow. so that's 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 a cool thing about grand teton park yeah. you know you have that range i hope you edit all this i know like i just sort of like go off <laughs> i don't know i hate I it i don't like to edit first of all it takes takes way too much time because uh, I, I have know. to like rewatch it over and over, but uh, yeah, right? I, I love it. Like, okay, I think, all right. I, listen, I, kinda, I, I, I you get me talking, and I just keep going. So I apologize for being. Well, David, um, I do this for me, and if people want to come along for the ride, perfect, awesome. Cool. I think that people that want to listen to stuff like this are going to be a little bit more like me, where I want to know, I want to yeah. know what you know. You've been there for yeah. so long. You are the kind of like the expert, and I want to know. I don't. When I go to, to Jackson Hole and when I go to the Grand Tetons, yeah. I want to go to the places that you think are really cool and really neat that aren't going to be overcrowded because that's the stuff. That's, sure. That's what gets us out there in the in the in the, yeah. in the wilderness to begin with. Yeah. And there's, you know, there's definitely like this this localism that, you know, that goes on. And and some people would be like really bummed if I was, you know, like talking about like my favorite secret places and you know, but then there's like, you know, like Mark Smiley, like sells like Gaia route, GPS routes. <laughs> right. You know, for, for, you know, and so, I mean, you know, I don't know. And I do, and I do really honestly feel like, especially now, you know, it's like we, we, you know, our, a lot of these ecosystems are are really under threat, you know, from all sorts of different things. And so people need to know about them and appreciate them and love them, like love these places. Right. And yes, we can over love them. Absolutely. That's definitely a thing, but I think we're still under loving it at this point. You know what I mean? Mm. So, um, so yeah, I mean, I think that like, you do have to be careful, you know, it's, it's easy to, you know, be here and, and, and you have to, this is a dangerous place, you know, and you gotta be on guard and, and your rescue isn't always just like a cell phone call away, you know, depending on what happens and where you are and the terrain. No. You know, so you can't take it lightly. And and that's one thing that like worries me about the picnic is that because it's like turned it into this like triathlon, like turned climbing the grand into this like multi-sport thing that like is kind of like has become a cool thing to do. I do, you know, worry that, you know, that people will take the Tetons too lightly and they do it every year. And people like look up, they get to the parking lot, same parking lot where you climb the grand and there's a mountain right there that's Tiwanot. Um, right in front of you which has been used you know done in picnics but like tiwanot is like so appealing because it's like the, it's like the shortest approach you could hope for in a mountain you know it's like you you walk like a half hour and then you're going a straight uphill you know for like five thousand feet but you get up like high enough up there and it gets like really serious like quite quickly you know and tiwanot is notorious for killing um young inexperienced mountaineers you know, they want to go to the closest mountain. It, it's right there. It looks rad. And Tiwanot is super dangerous, mm. you know? So you just got to be aware, you know, and you got to learn, right? You got to like put in your, you got to, you know, you got to put in the time to like learn your skills and rock climb on other places and climb. You know, there's a lot of the, Tiwan, the, the Tetons are great because you can, 
you can progress in your mountaineering, you know, going, you know, hitting one mountain after another. Mm -hmm. Um, and you know, if you're, if you're, um, and if you're, and if you're poor, you learn how to like, you know, and you want to do it, then you got to like get creative. You, you know, you got to get the backcountry permits to sleep in the backcountry. Um, but you know, you gotta, you'll probably do some car camping and some, um, different sneaky spots, you know, whatever you got to do. Um, it is, it is tricky given how expensive it's gotten here, but it is possible. Yeah. yeah. David, before, if you don't mind, before I let you go, yeah. you've already kind of alluded to some other picnics, some other things that you're, you've done and some other things that other people are doing. It's not, it, just, it seems like it's not just caught on there at Grand Tetons. It's caught on all over America. People are just coming up with their own version of a picnic. That, yeah. Like you just said, it, ha it just has to be some sort of self-propelled multi-sport mm -hmm. adventure. And I think you added that one part of it has to scare the you know crap out of you. <laughs> so what, what is that? Or not what one is that? part, maybe multiple parts. Actually. Maybe multiple parts. <laughs> Those are the um, best. I mean, yeah, a few picnics, it's been like every part has been scary, actually. So what are yeah. some ones that you've seen other people do that you're just like, oh, wow, that's really cool. I saw the Yosemite one. Yeah, the Yosemite one is sick. That was Jason Hardrath and Ryan. Um, I can't. I'm spacing on Ryan's last name right now, but uh, Ryan Tetz and those guys. Um, yeah, they invented a, like a, a picnic that was fully, um, fully uh, legitimate as far as picnics go. Um, you start in Camp Four in Yosemite Valley. You ride up to Tuolumne Meadows, uh, right, which is like four thousand feet elevation gain, if not more. Um, and then you swim across uh, Tanaya Lake, a uh, cold alpine lake up there. And then you do what they call the um, Triple Crown. And that's you climb uh, Tanaya Peak and uh, Cathedral Peak and Mathis Crest. And then you come back to Tanaya Lake, swim back across, and then ride your bike all the way back down to Camp Four. And those guys like crushed it. Uh, they did it. In like 16 hours and change, I think, which is just mind blowing. They're both like super athletes. So they not only invented a picnic, but then they also just like topped it by like doing it like at a super fast, you know, clip that like is going to be hard to beat for a long time, I think. Yeah. And, and soloing those mountains is, yeah, that's even more serious than soloing the grand. That's like five, seven, five, eight soloing on the Mathis crest, super exposed, like, like the very definition of a knife edge ridge. That you're walking along the top of it's rad wow. and um yeah and then i've heard of uh so i've heard of other picnics in and people have done picnics in montana uh people have done picnics in michigan i've heard um and a lot of other people have done other picnics in the tetons and then i've done you know a bunch of different ones myself my one of my favorites is the hood the hood nick or the mount hood picnic mm. um is me, yeah, it's that's where you you start in Hood River and you swim back and forth across the Columbia River, which is a mile wide, and depending on when you do it, like can be a pretty stiff current actually, you know, with barge traffic. So that's a that's a tricky one. Um, you swim back and forth across the Columbia, then you ride your bike up to Hood and like climb Hood back down, ride back down to Hood River, and then back and forth across the Columbia to finish it with, um, and. Um, but that one still could be like, I, I haven't done that with like, I haven't done the whole thing with skis, which I need to do. It's unfortunately, that, it's unfortunate that I'm getting as old as I am because I have like all these other picnics that I want to do and they just keep getting bigger and bigger too. But, you know, it's like, that's the cool thing, right? Like it's like kind of what motivates me to train. It's what motivates me to like, kind of like stay healthy it's like knowing that like if i'm going to do these like big picnics i gotta like keep my shit together all year long you know and train and and the older you get the more you have to like lift weights like that's kind of like it really is like the kind of like becomes like the most important part of your training like scientifically in order to like stay strong when you get older lifting heavy weights is wow. yeah well and um go ahead no. And, and it's, it's, it, yeah. So I'm going to keep, I'm going to keep trying to like figure out even at my uh, advanced age, um, I'm going to like continue to see what I can do. Well, I live in Alabama. I'm in Birmingham, Alabama, and we've oh, wow. got our, our highest point over here is 
a mere 2,500 feet ish. And we start at sea level though. Right. I'm, I'm this has got my wheels turning. I'm trying to yeah, figure yeah. out what, 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 what we can do that would be worthy of the name first and foremost, because we right. don't have, we don't have the elevation gain, no. but try to figure out something that would be worthy of the name and see if we can't figure out a, a picnic for Alabama, the Chiha. That would be Chiha. so cool, man. That would be so rad because you know, one of that's like, it's kind of like, I don't know. It's almost like a bummer about like in some ways for me, like the picnic, because it works really well on the Tetons because the Tetons just has to be this range with all these lakes along the bottom of them. Right. With these like beautiful bike paths. So it's like so perfect, but there are ways, like if you can get creative, you know, like, I, I, I mean, I think that there are picnics to be done in a lot of like the big cities and somebody came up with like a cool picnic in um, Charlotte, I think pot potentially, um, or where was it? What's like the town? What's a what town is it in South Carolina that has like a fairly large like bay or harbor with a lot of like forts in the middle of it? What am I thinking? Oh, you're talking about Fort Sumter? Are you talking about yeah. like Charleston? Charleston? Charleston. Charleston. Sorry. Charleston. Um yeah, Charleston. There was a guy that called me and he wanted to do a Charleston picnic. And we sort of talked about like how you could like link up various swims around Charleston harbor basically like linking up like different islands and forts and i was like holy shit and now you're to... talking about ocean swimming now yeah 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 i mean that's like right like if you want to scare yourself you know and now what, <laughs> what are you, where are you gonna go i mean that's you know and yeah you know like the level of like ocean swimming these days is so high and you know there's there's it's it's you know, there's all sorts. Of, I, I definitely think there's all sorts of like potential all over the place. I mean, there's probably some cool picnic that could be done in Manhattan, right? I mean, I kind of want to swim around Manhattan Island. I've, I I think that's like one of the coolest things that like people do. It sounds like horrible and scary and sketchy, but also, I mean, amazing, right? There's got to be a cool picnic that could happen there. Yeah. Too bad they won't let you like climb up and down the buildings anymore. <laughs> Climb up the Statue of Liberty or something. Right? Yeah. <laughs> no, it definitely, I think it gets uh, the wheels turning for sure. Um, yeah. But I would, you know, I would be, you know, if I were in your shoes, I would, you know, I'm sure you've probably seen some stuff. There's like, uh, you know, that's not really a picnic. You know, it needs to it be a little matter, scary. You know, it's like, it's like, I mean, it's really your own experience, you know? And, and, and I mean, if you wanted to put together like rollerblade, I mean, people here, it's funny because like uh, people are always like happy to tell me that they did like their own version of that picnic and they, and, and people call it the snack. And it's funny how different, like how many different versions of the snack that I've heard of that people have told me about. And every single one of them thinks that they came up with the, the like the name snack, which is kind of like adorable. Right. And a lot of the snacks have to do with like e-biking and stand up paddle boarding and then, like drinking margaritas or something like that, which right. is awesome. You know, it's like, I think it's great. And, and, um, and, and wherever you are, you can, you can link together like different activities and, you know, um, and people have like come up with some, uh, uh, ice. I mean, there should be like, like an ice fishing picnic, right? Like there's gotta be something like that out there. Um, there's a lot of cool ones that we could do in the winter and people now here are starting to get like figuring out, like, how can we do a winter picnic in the Tetons? That would be basically like, the Grand Teton picnic, but you also ski the Grand, right? And you can like, do you can ski the Grand. I've skied it a couple times. Yeah, yeah, it's definitely like very exciting, and um, yeah, yeah. I mean, there's no nobody's actually skied it all the way down without doing some sort of like rappelling or down climbing. You know, it's definitely like technical. It's it's um yeah, that's like a. Yeah, that's it's 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 amazing how many people are doing it these days. Honestly, it's a little scary. It gets a little crowded up there sometimes in places that you really don't want to have other people, yeah. you know. But um, but yeah, involving like skiing the Grand Teton and a picnic that's that's definitely like next level. Um, and I've started doing these like multi day picnics like in the Wind River Mountains and where you basically like use your bike to create a loop and then you traverse a mountain range like hike, you know, climbing the highest peak along the way and swimming lakes, you know, and these like ranges are all full of lakes. And so I did one in the, in the winds, which I went over the top of the highest peak in Wyoming, Gannett peak. 
and I swam five lakes on the way there and I swam five lakes on the way down. And then I linked them with a, uh, with a bike ride that went from basically like one end of the range or one side of the range to the other. Wow. Yeah. And so I'm going to do that. I try and do that again this summer with a different range. Have you done granite and, and, and I guess Gannett, both of those ranges right there, both those peaks? You know, I haven't done granite yet in, uh, in Montana and that's um, a hope that I might, I'm going to try and do that this summer. Aren't they, pr they're pretty close together, right? No, uh -uh. they're not. No, no granite. No granite is, well, I mean, I guess it depends what your version of close together is. I mean, they're within a few hundred miles, I guess, but. Oh, okay. I thought it was closer than that. No, no. Like uh, granite is in the winds and the, the winds is kind of like in central Western Wyoming and, you know, and granite is in um, Southern Montana. Um, so, um, but yeah, both amazing peaks and, and the winds and the winds picnic is like, if somebody, you know, if you're like in for like a picnic as like a multi-day adventure that will like blow your mind completely apart, the winds picnic is, it's incredible. And I did it when I did it, uh, I, you know, it's 10 lakes going over the highest peak in, in Wyoming, which is like glaciated. Right. And you're definitely like, you need ice axe and crampons. You need like bivy gear. Right. And then you need like a wetsuit because you're you're swimming in 45 degree lakes right so you need like booties and gloves and blah 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 and your and your dry bag right and food and water and so doing this like whole like route like the first time i did it i did it in four days and i was psyched like that was like a full test and then my friend neil comes along last uh last year and he did it in two days i don't even know how he did it in two days and i know he did it because he like has it all like documented you know on his you know on his phone um and um yeah and so there's it's like there's these really cool things that you can do in the mountains and then there's people who's going to come along and they're just going to blow your time out of the water and it's awesome it's like, incredible yeah yeah so it's fun yeah i i i love these conversations too because this is how i like get psyched for <laughs> like this summer yeah and, and you know and they're and picnics are a crazy thing because it's like they they fill me sometimes with like dread right they keep me up at night right like they 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 scare the shit out of me you know and and that's why i have to do them that's like i mean swimming across the columbia river at night like i had to do the last time in order to like fit it all in was like a mental that was like a difficult mental leap for me you know it's like to be willing to get into the columbia river by myself at three o'clock in the morning when it's dark and i know there are barges out there and like, and why am I doing this for no good reason? Right. But I fucking did it, you know? And it was like, and I made, and I crossed that like barrier in my head and, and then the rest of the picnic was glorious just be, you know, cause I had done that part of it. And so, yeah, I mean, that's why it's caught on, right. It's really, that's why picnics have caught on because they, they, they are, they are ways that you get like almost like a Mount Everest experience right? For a 50th of the cost, for a hundredth of the cost, you know, but it will like bring you to the same place and reward you in very similar ways, you know? For sure. Yeah. You know, my big thing is, so I go to the Grand Canyon every year. It's my favorite place on earth. Awesome. I haven't, haven't been to the Tetons, but um, so I've done rim to rim to rim numerous times. Um, right. The big thing I want to do next is do the R3 loop where you do, you go rim to rim, you start south, go to the north rim. You oh. have to, I might turn it into a picnic. I'll have to, logistically, I'll have to figure out how to get bikes. But there's about a 25-mile run, or it could be a bike. Oh. You have to go from the North Kaibab Trailhead to the North Bass Trailhead. Uh -huh. Go down the Bass Trail, swim across the Colorado River. I love it. Which I I did or I did uh, last year, by the way, really? in Grand Canyon, and then go up the South Rim on the Bass Trail, another twenty five miles to to back to the start. So th wow. those two twenty five milers up on the rim could be bikes. They could be, but just kind of figure out the logistics of it. But well, you just need two bikes, and you got to put the bikes where you lock the bikes where you're going to start the bike ride, and then at the end you got to go get the bikes or one of them. Yeah. Is right i mean yeah I, a couple picnics there are some like confusing logistics you know that's part of it um or annoying logistics but that sounds amazing that sounds incredible that would be a, it's a hundred it's a hundred miles that's sick 
Yeah, that's and is that normal? I mean, do people swim across the like the Colorado in this way? Um, normal, no. Discouraged, yes. Um, it's to my knowledge, it's it's a thing, but it's not encouraged by any stretch. That that current's moving so fast. Oh yeah, yeah. And oh, there's yeah. so you'd many rapids stream, and you'd have to like fucking haul ass across it. Oh, for sure. I mean. I'm sure it's doable, right? If you're willing to like end up downstream and you're going to like, and you have like the, the swimming ability, um, then hell yeah. I mean, that sounds like a picnic to me, man. I say go for it. <laughs> awesome. Yeah. And come to the Tetons, come to the Tetons. Like, uh, if you, I don't, what's your, what's your climbing ability? I live in Alabama, man. I don't have a lot. Is there good rock climbing in Alabama? Yeah. I've never really gotten into that. Um, but I mean, that's I, where you start, right? Like that's really where you started a climbing gym, you know, you started a climbing gym and then you start, you, and then you move climbing outside. Like if you, if you wanted to do like a picnic or something like this, that's how I, and you were, lived in a place like Alabama, that's how I would start the whole process, you know, is like going to a climbing gym and meeting climbers, right? Getting to know climbers, making friends with climbers, like going with climbers to out, outside, right. And starting to climb like outside. And then you know, like developing, you know, the other skills and the other and the endurance that you need, right? And that's like swimming, open water swimming, cycling, right? And then like hiking uphill. You know, you definitely got to be like a yeah. strong uphill hiker to be able to do the picnic. I've got right? all that. I've done Ironman races, like you know, oh, I've, yeah. I've, yeah. I'm, I've done a hundred mile race before. Like I've got the I've got the endurance. It's yeah, yeah. it's probably the technical climbing. Um, have you been to Maine? Have you done Katahdin by chance? I have actually done Katahdin. Yeah. So, I mean, how would that compare to the Tetons? Because I felt like there was a lot of scrambling there. There was a lot of, I wouldn't know, I don't know if it's class five, but. No, uh, well, the scrambling is like, I don't really recall. I mean, it's, is it, it's, I mean, you're using your hands, but it's not really exposed, right? You're sort of like walking up a giant pile of green rocks as I remember. <laughs> That's part of it, but then there's Knife's Edge. You know, you have to go across Knife's Edge. It's probably 500 yards, maybe 1,000 yards across. Um, right. I, was, I wasn't right. scared, but they say it's a pretty treacherous spot. Right. Well, yeah, I don't know. I think, like, you know, the Grand Teton, it's, it's, a, it's a different level of exposure. You know, that's really what I think the difference is. Like, you know, you, you're up on the – when you're doing the technical climbing up on the Grand Teton – there is literally like several thousand feet, like right directly below you, you know? So it's, you got to get, and that's, and that's definitely part of it is getting used to exposure, you know? And so having some time, you know, if you're going to come out to the Tetons, you know, give yourself enough time to get acclimated, give yourself enough time to like climb some peaks ahead of time mm -hmm. and do some other like climbing. I mean, Tiwanak is a scary mountain um, and it's dangerous, but it is a really amazing warm up for the Grand Teton. And they call it class four. I think it's a little bit more like, like five one climbing. If you're really good, you know, at scrambling, it's doable, but it's definitely like heads up, you know. Mm. But you know, but if I go up and down Tiwanak, like if you know, in in July, like in mid July, then I feel pretty good about climbing the ground after that. Mm. Yeah. I'll definitely, uh, I'll, I'll, de I definitely have to acclimate. There's no question about yeah, it. Yeah, yeah, so. yeah, yeah. And what I was saying, like, yeah, it's like the other, like, you know, you have to gain. Into, I mean, that wasn't just like talk, talking about you specifically. I'm talking about like just like somebody who might be listening to this sure. and being like, how do I even start into this, right? Yeah. Like, that's kind of like the way I would think. Yeah, no doubt for sure, David. Thank you so much for doing this. I appreciate the time you've taken. Oh yeah, totally. Well, I, I hope that it was helpful or entertaining. I mean, in some ways, like we didn't even explain like how. Um, uh that the you know that it is like there's they, like it started on the grand teton right in the tetons and then like kind of like spread to all these other peaks and then spread i guess we did talk about that a bit how it spread elsewhere um but i'm gonna i'm gonna yeah, bring it to I mean, alabama david yeah and meaning like if you come to the tetons like you could like, i guess what i'm trying to say is that like um you know you could come out here and you could do a picnic involving like a lot of other different lakes and other mountains, right? So you can do a picnic that really warms up to the Grand Teton mm -hmm. picnic. You know, that was like the first picnic and like kind of the most power, power uh, like the most popular. But, you know, you could do a uh, a picnic that goes across Phelps Lake, which is another like unbelievable, beautiful lake, about the same distance, 1.3 miles. 
And then you can go up Buck Mountain. And Buck is like class three, class four, definitely like fun and exciting and challenging, but, you know, not like the Grand Teton, right? So there is like a progressive step, you know, that you can take, you know, to like get yourself to do the Grand Teton one. Yeah. And I would definitely do that. You know, if I go out there, you know, I think you mentioned it's in such a, it's kind of hard to get to um, already. Yeah. So if I'm going to be there, I'm, I want to be there and I want to try to experience yeah, as much as I can. And you're going to have, I mean, especially someone like me coming from where I'm coming from, you got to acclimate. So acclimate, spend some time, do a couple of smaller peaks and then the grand yeah. finale, get ready for the, for the big one. So David, thank you so much for Absolutely. doing this and thanks for the yeah. information and, yeah. uh, and thanks for sharing your stories. Of course. Yeah. My pleasure. Hey nice guys. Thank you. Great to meet you guys. Thank you so much for tuning in. We're going to see you next time.